Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Christy Yi, and I'm the Implementation and Practice Management Specialist for Euclid Vision tonight, or Euclid Vision. Um, tonight, we're going to cover a lot of ground centered around how to increase your patient engagement and retention. Uh, we're going to talk about reducing your remakes and increasing that first fit success. To help me tonight, I am joined by the one and only Dr. Rob Garowitz. You guys, I don't even know how to begin to describe how lucky we are to have him here tonight to share his knowledge and his expertise. Um, he is one of the most successful orthokeratologists with over 20 years of ortho -K experience. He's joining us tonight from Illinois, where he owns his own private practice. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that we do have the QA box open and active. So if you have any questions for Dr. Garowitz that you'd like to ask him, please enter those in the chat box. And we're going to try to get to as many of them tonight as uh, we can at the end of the webinar. And with that, like I said, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. So I'm going to actually stop talking and turn this directly over to Dr. Garowitz. Thank you, Christy. And I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Rob Gerowitz, as uh, Christy said, and uh, my practice is located in Palatine, about 40 minutes northwest of Chicago. I started as an orthokeratologist over 23 years ago, fitting uh, Euclid lenses and Euclid designs as my go-to choice for patients of all ages, while also ma managing myopic progression in children. In this time, I fit a couple of thousand patients, young, old, even myself, and currently I'm managing over 500 active patients on our program. Often doctors who are using these molds find three distinct areas where they need the most help. This goes beyond the initial fitting process. These are concerns and they're expressed by the new practitioner and the veteran orthokeratologist alike. So let's get into it. But first of all, let's see if I can get my screen to advance. This is my disclosure for your viewing pleasure. You'll notice throughout this talk that I won't refer to the device we use for OrthoK as a lens, a retainer, or anything other than a mold. Why is that? Well, first, it's because each night we remold our patient's corneas to maintain the OrthoK effect. Second, there will always be entities that will try to get into our programs, our practices, and our pockets by making ortho -K molds a commodity. By defining what we're doing in corneal reshaping as a vision program with therapeutic benefits, we're keeping this out of the outsider's greedy hands and maintaining control of our specialty. As a matter of fact, in my practice, I stopped charging for molds altogether and now charge just one flat fee for the entire program as a package. It's my goal to get other orthokeratologists to see the logic of this approach and not let ortho-K and myopia management go the direction of soft contact lenses as a commodity. Well, folks, hang on one second. There we go. There will come a time when you have a new patient in your chair whose myopia has progressed in a short while. You'll explain myopia management and orthokeratology at length. Everything you say is 100% correct, and the parent is nodding along in agreement. Then you'll say, let's get this party started. And no matter what else you say or do, all that parent wants for their child is glasses. Well, it's their kid, and you can't force a treatment on them, but you can refuse to continue the cycle of glasses-induced progressive myopia in the future. I will actually tell the parent that I'll prescribe their kid glasses this year, but if they want me to be their eye doctor next year, I won't prescribe anything that is not a myopia management device. So, um, Dr. Rob, like leaning on all of your experience that you've had, what are some of the things that you've done in office to improve your, your patient capture rates? Great question, Christy. Talking with parents about ortho -K is important, but talking about ortho -K to kids is mission critical. The in-office doctor-led consult is where the magic happens when it comes to signing up new ortho -K patients. We do our free after hours consults and we talk to the kids so they get to know us. We, we ask them, hey, what's good about wearing glasses? And the answer is always a short one. They help me see, well, of course. But when we ask them what's bad about wearing glasses, that's when we get a laundry list of things they don't like. Also, most parents aren't even aware of how their children see without their glasses. And so 
I'm going to take a page from Dr. Tom Wachewski's playbook. And when he does VAs uncorrected, he starts by having them read the lowest line and work their way up line by line. So eventually they'll find something that they can read. We also spend about another 15 minutes explaining everything about ortho K. The last thing I do is ask the child themselves if they'd like to see better without glasses. As doctors, we can want to have the child on the program, and the parents may want it desperately, but we have to get that kid on board. And once we have their agreement, we know that it's usually safe to proceed. And this uh, consult allows you the opportunity to set your expectations of the parent and child and their expectations of you as well. Because of the relative thinness and flexibility of the molds, daily handling, even if done well, can warp, steepen, or flatten the base curves. And that can cause unwanted and induced over or under correction. No parent really wants to wait until there's a problem caused by the old molds to do a replacement. So we just include a new set in each maintenance program at no additional charge. Lastly, because of the overnight wear nature of ortho -K, these yearly visits give me and you the fresh opportunity to check the patient's eye health and short circuit any of the weird things that they have started to do over the intervening year. If you discuss the patient's ongoing and yearly needs at the consult and even remind them at the six month appointment, patient buy-in for yearly maintenance is virtually immediate. We let our patients know that regardless of their vision at the end of 12 months, we'll be automatically replacing their molds at their maintenance exam. It's been my experience that patients will see better, feel better, and have better maintenance control for the years that they're on their ortho -K program. All right, I can't stress this enough. Go to eBay and buy yourself an, a radioscope. Having one can truly demonstrate to the parent how much the molds may have changed rather than the child's vision. For example, at a yearly visit, the naked eye refraction that you measure indicates your child patient may need 75 more correction. Then you measure the base curve and find out that instead of an 865 base like you originally ordered, it now reads 850. It's steepened by plus 75, and that accounts for the child's presumed refractive change. It's also a good idea to get your patients in the habit of bringing their molds to every appointment to allow for mid-year deep cleaning and end-of-the-year base curve measurements. Um, so, Dr. Rob, I think you bring up some really, uh, really great points here, um, especially like with the radioscope. It's really hard to know uh, without that particular tool, you know, did the child have an organic prescription change or did their retainers just change? Um, and, you know, to your point, changing those retainers frequently, um, you know, really helps prevent some of that as well. But um, when it comes to deep cleaning, what are what are some of the things that you like to use in office to help keep those lenses clean? Well, we'll use Progent as a deep cleaner. Um, we'll do it at the mid-year visit minimum. Some patients will have it done quarterly. And then there are patients that we do recommend to have it done monthly. So yeah. again, it depends on their tear chemistry. Yeah. Um, so like moving on, um, you know, working for a manufacturer, we get, we get to see numbers in a way that you probably don't. And when we look at your statistics, um, Dr. Rob, you have like one of the lowest uh, remake uh, uh, percentages. Uh, you have like one of the highest first, first fit success rates. Oh, can you can you share some of your secrets on that? Like how how have you achieved this? This is, I mean, compared to your peers, you're you're like literally blowing it out of the water. Well, Chris, you're gonna make me blush now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> it's just, it, I mean, like it, it, it really is it, like when we look at, when we look at you statistically, it's, it's like very impressive. And so um, I, I'm really excited to have you share some of your, some of your uh, top tips and best practices. Well, thank you. I'm going to tell you that first fit, first fit success is a reality. And according to the SMART study, it can happen in about 87% of the cases. I really think this can be pushed into the 90th percentile if some of the following things are done even prior to dispensing that first pair of molds. Refractions. Love them, hate them, do them yourself or have others do them. All that matters is relates to a good ortho-K outcome is that they're accurate. 
Otherwise, it is garbage in, garbage out, and you will have to do refits. Also, you only have one chance, the first chance, to get good free pit, good pre-fit topos. We use an old punctal gauge, and we put a temple cover on the end of it, and we use that to hold up the patient's upper eyelid. And then we ask the child to pull their lower lid down to get the lids out of the way and get a good topography image. So let me show you this. This is using the Medmont topographer, and this is what I call bad Myers. So if you look at three and nine, where those little cutouts are, that's where the Medmont topographer has its uh, centering bulbs. Then you can see that it's shifted way nasally and you're not getting the center of the cornea per se. Looking at six o'clock, you can see that there is a lacrimal lake obscuring some of the data on the lower side. And up above that upper eyelid is just covering up too much of the cornea. Lastly, if you look at the yellow circle, the green circle, sorry. Uh, if you look at the green circle, you'll see that the Myers are all wrinkled. They're jammed together. We call that ring jam. Sometimes that's fixable just by having the patient blink a few extra times or throw a wedding tear, a wedding drop in their eye. But the point is, is you don't want the Myers to look like that. And you can insist that whoever's doing your topography get everything looking like this. This is an example of good Myers. Looking at three and nine, you can tell that that pattern is well-centered. The little bit of lacrimal lake is really not covering up too much of the lower segment and the upper lid is pulled out of the way and all the Myers look clear and even. Now the next thing that can happen is that you uh, you, you just let your, you have your patient there and they let you know that uh, they broke their newer right mold and uh, they broke their most recent backup right mold. And now they're wearing one from, they think two years ago. And just like fitting soft torics, this can all get confusing in a New York second. So what I've done since the beginning is I label each order with subscripts like R1, L2, depending on which number I'm ordering, and the order dates to keep it all organized. So the more organized you are in your record keeping, the easier it is to troubleshoot issues. During our consult, we ask the patient what their goal is as relates to their program. And we wanna make sure it's a functional goal and not some 20 slash number. We write that goal down exactly as I stated it. And then we remind them sometimes of what their goal was because people will invest in things that have a clear cut benefit for themselves or for their kids. Oh, I swear, if I had a nickel every time a parent got a, just a little bit wacky when their child missed one letter on the 2020 line, well, you know what I'm talking about out there. When my patients come into the exam room, the first thing I ask them is, how are you doing on your program? And I call this the key question and I write down exactly what they said. So not only does this give me a record of their perception, but allows me to counter objections that may be raised. I'll often repeat the parent the patient's comments back to the parent so they understand we're looking for a functional outcome. That out in the real world, there's no difference per se between 2020 and 2025, and that I'm the only one in the room that spends their day in the dark reading an eye chart. So we want to let them know that this missing a letter here is not the end of the world. And I always try to deliver this in an informative way. So what really happens when you evaluate that first fit? Well, the answer is a lot. First, little Susie is nervous because she's never worn molds before. You just put that yellow drop that has her even more freaked out. She's now being asked to sit into a machine made for a big person and you've got a bright light shining into her eyes. Her little brother is over there coloring on your exam room walls and her mother is on her cell phone right after telling her to sit up straight. Oh yeah. Gravity, that cruel mistress is pulling the new molds down on her eyes and making her blink even more. And all this time, you're trying to evaluate this first fit. So I'm going to say this, unless the mold is riding on her eyebrow or on her cheek or on her chin, in other words, if it looks reasonable, go ahead and dispense it. The next morning, you're going to take difference maps, and that's going to tell you where that mold positioned while she slept. And that's the data you most need to evaluate that fit. 
Now then, in spite of all I just said, here is one caveat. Early on in my ortho K career, I was talking to one of my mentors and I, that I had a patient whose topos were slightly off center and not totally symmetrical. As I was getting ready to redesign the mold, she said to me, say, how does a patient think they're doing? And I said, great. Then she asked what their vision was. And I said, 2020 right eye, 2020 left and 2015 OU. What she said next is, stuck with me ever since that day. And she said, remember, Rob, we're in the business of clearing vision and slowing progression, not making pretty pictures. From this experience, I learned that as long as the patient is seeing clearly, their corneas are clear and things are improving or have stabilized at a good level with good results, I don't make any changes. In other words, I let their molds do their thing before I start thinking about making changes. And it's important to remember that a minus 25 naked eye post-treatment refraction is within lab tolerance for production, and that a half millimeter treatment zone decentration will not greatly affect VA or their outcome. As a matter of fact, slightly temporal is a new central. Going after these small changes will result in increased chair time for you, the doctor, and more inconvenience for the already stressed out parent and their busy, busy kids. But if you're going to make a change, here's a pro tip. It may be best to only change one major parameter at a time and then give that two, three weeks to do its stuff and see what's going on with that one change. Uh, just seriously, I, I can't stress that last that last point enough. I, I think that was one of my biggest uh, learning curves when I first started fitting orthokeratology lenses was chasing that pretty picture where you know, uh, my patient was having great outcomes visually and I look at their corneal topography and I'm like, I can make it just a little bit better. And so, you know, all you're doing is increasing your remakes, increasing your chair time, inconveniencing your patients. Um, so again, I, I can't, I can't, I can't stress that enough. That is, that is such a valuable tip that you've just shared to everybody. It, um, it really is, you know, something that, you know, for me, I, I had to learn the hard way where it's like, Hey, my patient's seeing well, they're happy you know, their, their vision is stable. We're not progressing. The lens is doing exactly what it needs to do. And I don't need to have that picture perfect uh, topography. But absolutely, um, Christy. I mean, as a matter of fact, you'll be here with this, this mold, you'll change it, you'll change it, you'll change it, you'll change it, you'll change and it. go back, right? Back to the one. original design. <laughs> yes. Believe me, I did that 20 years ago and I don't do it anymore. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's a practice. I, I can happily say I've also discontinued. Um, okay, so let's move on to a different topic. So when we look at uh, trying to maintain ongoing and repeat orthokeratology programs, what are you what are you doing? Like, what what is your secret to get those patients to keep coming back? Well, ortho K as a specialty really is a team effort. We want our front desk staff to ask patients if they're interested in myopia management for their kids and our text to do topos and talk about ortho K. We mostly do our consults the last hour of the day and sometimes staff needs to stay a little bit later. And lastly, our I and R trainers need to na answer not only the 10,000 questions I've already answered, but also keep their cool while teaching insertion and removal to apprehensive children and their helicopter moms. So why shouldn't our staff get a piece of the action for all their efforts? We give every staff person a bonus for each ortho K patient we start every month on top of their normal bonuses. There's a lot to be said also about clear vision, healthy corneas, and slowing progression. But what else can be done to keep your ortho K patient committed to their yearly appointments? Well, this is what a couple of our colleagues said. Roxanne has an amazing ortho K following, and this is one of the reasons why she genuinely cares. Now, Julio's maintenance program is a little bit different. It features a comprehensive exam, includes one pair of new molds, topography, tomography, and optos. And he set up a membership program model. And the highlights of this are a $50 frog card. That's his logo there. Uh, that's good for standard sunglasses or 50% off of premium brand name sunglasses. 20% off of medical services, concierge one-on-one -on -one priority services and direct access, a deep, progen deep cleaning, and free membership to his lunch and learn meetings. That's what I call all-inclusive. 
All right. If anyone should complain about working Saturdays, it's this little Jewish kid from Skokie. Keep this in mind. These patients are the busiest children on the planet. Aside from homework, they've got more extracurricular activities than a politician with an unlimited travel budget. So yeah, I work Saturdays, around 44 of them every year. And sure, I'd like to take them off, but servicing these kids is important too. Now, for those of you who say, I don't want to work Saturdays, consider this. Imagine how much goodwill you might recoup if you added even one Saturday per quarter or per month for those patients. Genuinely speaking, clear care is getting harder to find due to the fact that the platinum on the disc comes mostly from the Ukraine and Russia. And even with stores that still have this available, do you really want to make more money for CVS? So in our office, we sell Oxycept for hands-free disinfection, along with Blink, Optase, and Ivisia for insertion and removal. And this is sold directly to our patients. We also have some patients deep clean with Progen as frequently as every month. So for these patients, we have them do it at home. And trust me, it's not that hard that parents can't learn it. In other words, by recommending good quality solutions and drops to our patients, they aren't readily found in stores or online. We offer convenience and a profit center for our practice. And by giving a baker's dozen discount, we marry these patients to our solutions. Now, patients may feel that they've aged out of worth okay. No such thing. However, somewhere in the multiverse is a study that demonstrates progressive myopia can continue until a patient is in their mid-20s. My own progression didn't stop until I was 27, and I wasn't raised on tablets, video games, and smartphones. So given this fact, does it really make sense to recommend stopping myopia management and using standard soft lenses or even LASIK before your young patient is through what I call the danger years? This takes a solid conversation with the parents at the consult and when that older, patient's, older patient is starting to look at colleges. Most of these kids follow my advice and stay on the program, but for that small percentage that are concerned about sleep schedules and college life, we then talk about multifocal soft lens myopia management. Above all, we, should, we as practitioners should not want to, want to end their management prematurely and allow them to restart that downward spiral towards increasing myopia. Your best ortho patient moves moving away. That really doesn't have to mean the say goodbye because, yeah, your young patient is saying goodbye to your practice and your program to go live somewhere else. What do you say to that? Okay, Jimmy, is your family going to stay in this area after you move? Well, yes, they are, doctor. That's great. Why don't we set up your yearly maintenance exam to coincide with those holidays you'll be coming back for? After you buy your airline ticket, give us a call and we'll set up your appointment. Does this always work? Well, no, but when it does, you've managed to maintain that relationship because a successful ortho K patient is also one of the most loyal. It's August 15th. Young Billy isn't so young anymore. In fact, he's leaving for college and has just come in for his yearly maintenance exam. However, when you say, ask him when he's leaving for school, he proudly says, tomorrow. And just like that, I have a new gray hair. <laughs> Literally after 23 years, a penny has dropped and I finally figured this out. So when we have a high school junior whose exam is due in March or April or May, we start to move them into June. That is in March of 2024 during their senior year. We'll see them in, for their March exam in April or May instead. And in 2025, when they're finishing up their freshman year at college, we see them in early June. This allows me all summer if I have to redesign and work with them and then work around our mutual vacation schedules to dispense and recheck their molds. It also plugs them into a December mid-year checkup when they're back from their fall semester. Just remind them not to come in the day they finish finals so that we get a good week of regular wearing time in advance of this visit. For the December, January, or February maintenance exam high school student, we incrementally move them back into November. This way I can see them in Thanksgiving, order their new molds, and then Bob's your uncle, dispense and check them at winter break. Plus this puts their mid-year check into June or July. Of course, all bets are off if they aren't coming back for Thanksgiving or going skiing at Christmas. 
but most of these patients want the time of their choice, will pre-appoint and usually keep their appointments. Often patient, parents don't think about the, I'm sorry, often parents only think about the child with the strongest prescription. Let's face it, there is nothing more frustrating for an orthokeratologist than that 14-year-old who has been allowed to progress to minus six when they could have been started at age eight with a minus one. So when doing consults, I always ask about family members and other siblings, and then I offer to do free consults on them so that we can take care of their needs too. There's asking for referrals, and then there's really demonstrating that you welcome referrals. The patient appreciation check has been used in our office almost since the start of our program. After a new patient pays for their program, we send out this $50 pretend check to whoever referred them in to use for any product or service in our office. They have no redeemable value for cash and must be presented in office as we treat them like money. Over the years, patients have applied them to sunglasses, solutions, I even had one patient who referred in so many of his friends that one year his maintenance program was free. I'd like to say that everything I'm telling you today came from my own gray matter, but that would be a bald faced lie. In fact, this is one that I swiped and deployed. By constantly communicating with my adult ortho K patients or the parents of kids on the program, I express an ongoing interest in their children keep my name off of their back burner, and ultimately open the door to two-way communication. In each of these short notes, I also ask them to tell their friends about our program and encourage a regular flow of referrals. When the patient is in for their day one follow-up, we print up topography for one of the patient's eyes. We write down their binocular BVA and staple our business card to it. And then I give this to the parent and I ask them to put it on their fridge so that when their friends are over, they can tell them all about our program and give them one of my cards. I also remind them that we reward referrals. Don't let your ortho -K patients fall through the cracks. The best way to replace ortho -K patients is to not lose them in the first place. Since these folks are the lifeblood of my practice, I keep track of them myself. At the end of each of my days, I post their visit date and return time frame on a simple MS Word table. Quarterly, I print this table out so my patient care coordinator can check it against my recall software and see who's overdue for their maintenance program exam or their mid-year appointment. Have I mentioned how busy these kids are? Over the years, this simple but powerful pro tip has kept my orthopaid K patients committed to their programs. As your young patient's parents are sitting in your exam room, are they speaking to each other in a foreign language? Be bold. Ask them if their children go to a foreign language school. Ask to be put in touch with that school's director. And then offer to that person to come in and speak to the parents while their kids are in class. As most of these programs are privately funded, I gift a small cash, do cash donation for the room rental. Then I ask the school to send out announcements one week prior to my talk to all their parents. We produced a banner that sits outside the room I speak in to draw attention from those walking by. And for those attending, I make sure that they are signing in on a sign-in sheet so that I can send them more information later. Lastly, I'm prepared to give them a great explanation of ortho -K and its myopia management effects and answer all their questions. But Rob, I live in the most non-ethnic part of the country. This was a comment one of the most gifted orthokeratologists I know once said to me. And at the risk of stereotyping or racial insensitivity, and I say this because in my experience, the Chinese, Korean, Indian, and Eastern European communities have the strongest social networks. So again, at the risk of racial insensitivity, I asked them, does your town have even one Chinese or Indian food restaurant? Who owns your dry cleaning store, the local convenience store? Have you done a Google search for foreign language schools in your area, ethnically oriented churches, a synagogue that's even remotely close? And since that conversation and with a little detective work, he has one of the most successful myopia management practices in his state. Okay, your patient has spent a couple of thousand dollars to do this program. Now you're two or three pairs in and the vision is still 2040 and their topos ain't looking so great either. 
In my opinion, this is more about patient success and less about profit at this point. But what can you do? Here's the pecking order I typically choose. Query first the patient if they're sure that their child is actually wearing their molds every night. You know, this is a kid that would never lie. If the topos don't suggest they are, ask the parent to use a pen light or their phone to check the child after insertion to see if the mold is in the right place. That is, did their kid really put them on? Or refit with an entirely different design or wash the patient out on the chance that my original data wasn't 100% accurate and refit. Now, these options won't always work, but at least no one will question your efforts and will come to the conclusion it was a no-fault scenario. But let's say none of these items are the real culprit. We all know that some corneas are truly rigid. In these cases, I wash them out and refit with soft lens multifocals. We will normally use trial lenses for the rest of that year or full packs at no additional charge. Remember, you already charged them once and they paid handsomely. At the start of this new modality, I let the parent know what the child's new maintenance program will cost on a yearly basis. I also reiterate that this new system will only work properly if the child wears them every day. But Rob, I've got inventory sitting around getting dusty. <laughs> I'm LOLing out loud. Kids might still need glasses for camp, high school and college exam weeks, and non-prescription sunglasses. For high school and college students, we offer to have them come in for an extra refraction recheck the afternoon after they've missed one or two nights of regular wearing time. We let the parents know that as long as they get the glasses from us, there's no charge for this additional test. Sometimes adults on ortho -K will need a very low fine-tuning prescription to drive home in the evening due to normal daily regression. And presbyopes might also want uh, computer glasses. Let's not also forget that the DIMS technology is just around the corner in the U.S. Yeah, so those are some really great tips um, that you just shared. And um, I, I, I think I identify with this too. I'm, I'm a mild presbyope and I'm actually doing a little bit of under correction. And so just like you mentioned, I'm using some uh, like minus 50s for evening, like if I'm driving late at night and I just want that little bit of extra crisp vision. So um, again, really excellent tips there. There's always opportunities to sell glasses to our orthokeratology patients. You just have to be mindful of what those opportunities are and your opticians need to know how to sell to those opportunities. Um, I want to I want to keep the conversation moving a little bit though. Um, so we've talked a lot about getting new patients into your office, but um, how do we how do we talk uh, to uh, like patients that are maybe coming from elsewhere? I mean, we we talked about you know the patients that may be potentially moving to other geographical locations, but what about one that's um, moving into your area and is already an established orthokeratology patient? Um, do you, how do you handle those? Do you do you wash them out? Like like what is what is your process for that? Well, that's true. Our patients in general are more mobile than ever. And let's face the cold hard fact that they may move away and have no reason in the future to come visit your town just to visit you. Yeah. On the flip side of this, our parent, our patients who have already been fit with ortho -K molds and move into your area, and they search you out as the local expert to resume their care. In our practice, if the patient is doing amazing and I can get a minimum amount of background information like original case and I'm sorry, original case and pretreatment Rx, I'll measure everything I can off their current molds. I'll check their naked eye refraction and evaluate their current fit and over refraction. And with this data, I usually feel comfortable re replacing what's been working with new molds. Washout isn't a dirty word. Let's review some of the most common reasons for having to wash a patient out. For example, the patient who should be doing better. The patient was originally doing very well in their ortho -K program. Their difference maps demonstrated a clear delineation of their treatment zone and reverse curve or return zone. At a follow-up visit, you notice the treatment now shows incomplete zones and reduced VA. Prior to a refit or washout, consider this situation may also be caused by the patient not wearing their molds every night, lack of sleep, or missing one or two nights prior to their appointment. Again, make sure that child is wearing their molds every night. Make sure it's the most current set of molds. Make sure that they didn't miss any time just before their visit. Optometrists are an interesting breed. 
Even though the patient is long gone, they don't always share information or the information shared isn't always accurate, complete, or done in a timely manner. So what happens when you can't get your transfer patient's original refraction or pretreatment case? And since there's more than one brand of topographer out there, not having original maps that you can download for difference maps can short circuit your troubleshooting capabilities down the road. If you really want a pretreatment topo with your own device and be sure of the data, then a washout's gotta happen. What is recalcitrant epitheliopathy? This is SPK that's typically central that just won't go away no matter what you do regarding patient handling, removal, or care system. But it can even remain after steepening the base curve or reverse curve vault to create more vault. But there's uh, here's a couple of things to think about before you decide to wash out in the first place. Back in the old days of PMMA hard lenses, peripheral staining of three and nine was exceedingly common. It was noted and then ignored. So a trace amount of SPK should be addressed and our first line of defense is a progent deep cleaning, but let's not panic over it. Also certain multi-purpose cleaning systems have been shown to lead to chronic SPK. At the risk of naming names, we're talking about Simplus and Optifree. Proper removal is of vital importance to help prevent this problem. Molds adhere to the cornea overnight, and just reaching in with fingertips or suction cups and removing them is like tearing off a Band-Aid. You're going to remove cells, you remove too many, and you're going to get staining. So we recommend a pre-removal artificial tear, and then releasing the mold suction by pressing in at the very edge of the lower eyelid in and up to the edge of the mold, that gets everything moving and the molds come out easier. You're only as good as your original data. In this case, even with your findings being 100% accurate, the patient still progresses. Well, it might be time to recheck that patient's refraction with a washout or add in 0.05% atropine or reduce the optic zone di diameter. So you want to do everything you can to slow progression, but it's also good to remind the parents at the consult that you're not going to promise to stop progression. Make sure that they repeat that after you say it because they'll forget it. And so you want to make sure that you're promising to slow progression, but not necessarily stop it. We've all seen this. The patient you prescribe minus three glasses when they were 50 years old comes back in yearly and there's a steady decrease in distance correction after they've turned 55. This happened to me. As a matter of fact, my pre-treatment minus four is now closer to a minus 250. And sometimes just steepening the base curve more and more won't be enough and they will need a washout to their new target. This used to be called second sight. This decrease in the distance RX has a current increase in near point requirements. So if you started your patient at minus 150 and they slowly drop to minus 50, they may shake your hand and thank you for curing them. And I'd recommend just smile and nod and congratulate them on their success. If your child or adult patient has glasses that they can wear, the washout method is pretty straightforward. Take them out of their molds. Let them wear their glasses until the washout is complete and refit. If they don't have glasses or aren't willing to wear soft contacts as a bridge during the washout process, that's a different problem. And now the whole thing becomes a little bit more complex. I'll have them stop wearing the mold in their non-dominant eye, get that eye to baseline and refit it first, and all this time, they can continue to wear the mold in their dominant eye if they're able to handle the anisole. Then after dispensing their new non-dominantized molds, we wash out their dominant eye and refit that. It's a sequential method that requires extra visits, but can be, be more user-friendly in the long run. For the four years that we ran the SMART study, the practices involved would wash out their ortho -K patients every year to baseline to determine if any progression occurred. Complete washout was defined as two consecutive visits in which the Ks and refraction were within about a quarter diopter of one another, and that the topos look consistent. We found this method to be accurate and repeatable.
depending on how long your patient has been in doing corneal reshaping and their initial RX at the start of their program. This can take anywhere between two weeks and up to eight or more weeks. Couch your patient in patience because the goal is not for the two months that they're off, it's for the next 20 years. Congratulations, you followed my advice. Your patient has been totally washed out over the last six weeks. Ks are stable, refraction is repeatable. The pretreatment topos and the washout topos look almost exactly the same. Then just for the fun of it, you decide to double check the process by doing a difference map. And guess what? For some reason, there's still some central corneal aplanation being demonstrated. Why does this happen? Well, 20 years after this conversation took place, I still don't know. So here's my next bit of advice. Ignore the ghost in the machine. After you refit the patient, it just won't matter. Practicing ortho -K is not like any other specialty in your office. This is a bold statement to be sure, but unlike VT, where there can be so much improvement over time, the patient may not be exactly cured, but is doing so much better functionally that the program can be ended. Or like glaucoma management, where although there's no cure, patients age out in a permanent fashion, if you get my drift. And it's not like a practice that's strong in one day soft lenses, due to the fact that there's not much manufacturer or distributor advertising for ortho -K. And now every Dr. Tom, Dick, or Harry says they're an expert in this field. Nope, an ortho -K specialty needs constant supervision and attention. However, the rewards of your ongoing vigilance will come back many fold both to your patients and your practice. Remember how everyone was inserting punctal plugs back in the 90s? Or how not long, that long ago every pair of glasses sold were aberration control freeform? These two topics rarely, if ever, find their way into our journals these days, but were fully bought into not so long ago. Ortho K, done with the intention of slowing childhood myopia progression, is an open-ended process, one that will take your patient from grammar school through high school, through college and grad school, and beyond. Practice with intention, Ortho K can develop the strongest loyalty among your patient base you've ever experienced. Want to add a dry eye clinic to your practice? How about Neurolens or Sclerals? By all means, do it. But don't forget that Ortho K is a continuing annuity to your business. And myopia management is the true calling of the ortho keratologist. So don't stop. Keep doing what you're doing. I want to thank you tonight. But what's the deal with that QR code? Well, if you're already a Euclid customer and would like to set up a time to talk with me about patient management, please do so by going through that QR code. If you'd like to be a Euclid customer, go to getEuclidCertified.com. And if you need help with a fit, the Euclid consultants are top notch. Please rely on their expertise. Thank you again and have a wonderful night. All right. So, um, Dr. Rob, do you have some time for some questions? Absolutely. All right. So this first one, I don't know um, if you can navigate back to slide. I believe it was 13 or if you just want to talk about it. But um, we have a we have a, a, a participant on that would like you to explain again how to hold the lids for the topography with the tool that you're using. OK, uh, which, which slide was it? 13? I, I believe it's 13. Yeah, there it is. OK. So uh, it's actually my assistant, Barry. Let me get out of this Q&A. Um, there we go. So um, what I did, we don't do that much plugging anymore. And when we did it, we were never using the big, big uh, punctal, ga punctal gauges. So I, if you look right above her lid, there is a, um, a temple cover that fit onto that probe. You can use anything you want. You could actually use a clean temple, but you want to get that upper lid well out of the way and then have the patient reach in and pull down the lower lid. You want to get that beautiful Meyer pattern and you don't want to accept from your technicians bad looking topos because it's a heartache down the road. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to your point on that one, I, th I think that is probably some of, you know, if, if there was one key takeaway 
um, getting those baseline topographies is, is really um, incredibly helpful for everything down the line. And um, I, I do a lot of staff training. And when I talk to the teams about topography, a lot of them don't know to look at the Meyer patterns. Um, they, they don't, they don't realize that they can even remove the color maps and actually just look at the rings. So um, none of them are familiar with like extrapolated data or what a poor topography could potentially mean for a doctor having to spend time troubleshooting an ill-fitting lens. And so, you know, if you've got, if you've got 10 minutes, you know, spend the time with your team. So that way that they recognize the difference between, you know, a good quality picture, like you mentioned, and one that is, that is not great quality and, you know, let them know that it's okay to invest the extra five minutes, use an artificial wedding drop if needed to, to get that better picture. But um, the extra five minute investment to, to get a good topo on the front side is worth, you know, sometimes hours of chair time later on trying to troubleshoot something that isn't working right. So again, that's that's a really great tip that you've shared. Thank you. You know, the other thing is during the consult, I'll look at their topos and I, I want to figure out what their elevation difference is. And there's a number of different ways to do this, but it's important to know right at the start, hey, I'm am I going to need a toric alignment curve to keep everything centered? And so uh, this is something that um, I can explain later after the fact. Uh, it's best used with uh, visual aids to do it. So yeah. I will do that after the fact. Yeah. Um, um, oh, sorry. I, no, I just want to go back to the QR code in case people didn't get it. Perfect. Um, and so the next question, and, and you did talk about this a little bit, but um, would you mind reviewing it again? What types of cleaning systems do you, do you uh, recommend uh, in your practice? and lubricants that you sell in office, and where are you sourcing them from? Okay, well, first of all, tap water is a definite no. I probably don't have to tell you that, but I'm gonna say it again anyways. Um, what we wanna do is hands-free cleaning. It's been my experience that doing digital cleaning can really change the shape of a mold. And it's a variable that you just don't need to have occur. The hydrogen peroxide systems are very effective and very hypoallergenic. And the cavitation of the bubbles does a good job of day-to-day -day cleaning. And certainly the hydrogen peroxide does an amazing job at disinfection. As far as, as, far as drops are concerned, well, I used to be um, you know thick as best for insertion. And if a patient is having some discomfort, thicker is better. Um, but not everybody likes that thick drop. Not everybody responds well to it. Um, we, I found that refresh is working good. Uh, refresh, uh, the standard one. I, I found that uh, Blink um, or Ivisia, they all work good. And getting things like hydrogen peroxide systems is kind of a heartbreak in and of itself these days. Uh, so I have been getting them from Dry Eye Rescue which is a Florida company. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. Um, one of our participants wanted to share with you that the temple sleeve is a fantastic idea um, and thanks for the great advice. Um, we also have a doctor that was curious about the washout period for patients that have worn their lenses for um, you know, a significant amount of time. Now you've addressed some of this in your, in your presentation. Um, but for say somebody who's worn the, worn the lenses for an extended period of time in your experience, like how long do you feel like that really takes, uh, for, you know, maybe somebody who's worn it for five to 10 years. Again, the, the key, and, and I had to do a washout after about 18 years. The key is to make sure that the patient is fully washed out, that you've taken it to a point where, you know, there's nothing left. And so that means making sure the K's and the refraction are repeatable. So maybe you started your patient and they were a minus two, and after 10 years, now they've creeped up to a minus 350. Well, the minus two doesn't mean anything anymore, but if you saw them at the start of the month, they were minus 350. The following week, they were minus 375. The following week, they're four and a quarter, and then they stay at four and a quarter for a while, you know, for two visits in a row. You know you're probably there. If the Ks are repeatable one week to the next, that's another indication in checking the topographies and don't do the difference map. Fair enough. Um, okay, so I think there was maybe some con uh, confusion on one of these. So I wanna read the question um, so that way you can provide some clarification. Rather than washing a patient out each year, why not simply order the exact same lens 
per the warranty, and then assess or fix the vision or the fit through those no those new lenses to determine if a fit adjustment is needed. Uh, that way, it uh, takes away the need to survive without the lenses. Okay, so I'm glad that this question got asked because I think I was misunderstood. I don't wash out at the end of every year. As a matter of fact, I don't want to do it. And more than that, the parents don't want to do it. So, you know, a lot of times I'm not convinced that the patient has progressed. And I'll t say that to the parent. I'll say, I think your child has stayed exactly the same as last year. But the only way to know for sure would be to wash them out for a month or so. But we're not going to do that. I am going to make a change to their molds or I'm going to order the exact same pair and then they'll have a fresh pair for the new year. So I absolutely don't wash out as a routine. I think it's egregious. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you on that. Um, for me, that is like one of like the last resorts. And I mean, and sometimes you just need to, to get a good fit, but um, I it, it is for me, like if I, if I don't have any other options. Um, do you have any ultimate tips for beginners who are just getting started in their orthokeratology practice? Um, Talk to the consultants at Euclid, read everything you can about ortho -K. watch any videos that are out there about ortho -K. You know, with the COVID shutdown, a lot of webinars got recorded. Um, and then make sure that you have all the pieces in place and start doing it. But don't start with minus sixes. Start with a minus 150 or minus two. Start with the bread and butter cases. Never use the phrase slam dunk, that'll kill you. Um, <laughs> But start start off with some basic cases. And above all, when that first case comes in and they're seeing 2020 after one night, try not to look too amazed yourself because uh, you'll be surprised how great this works. It, it, you know, it's also such a great feeling, isn't it? When you're like, heck yeah, that patient is like rocking it on day one. Mm -hmm. We don't ever guarantee it, but um, it more often than not, like you just pat yourself on the back and you're just like, oh, this is so great. <laughs> it's such a great feeling. I, I love it. Yeah. The other um, thing I want, can I, can I make one other comment, please? Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, next September is going to be the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, uh, their yearly international meeting. It's, it's a national meeting, but people come from all over the world. Um, I can't stress enough going to that meeting. You're going to learn as much in the hallways as you will in the classrooms, and you'll never find a group of people more willing to share in their knowledge or expertise than members of that academy. Yes, very, very passionate um, membership base uh, that are just all about orthokeratology and myopia management. It's, it's, it's a wonderful group to be around. Um, we have just a couple more questions if you still have time. Um, one of our doctors is asking, do you recommend clear care with hydroglide or are you recommending the original triple action? You know what, I never, stocked clear care. I never used it in my office. Before we did uh, uh, Oxycept, we were using Refine or its previous version, Soflon. And uh, so, you know, I like to use stuff that my patients can't get everywhere because, you know, I'm kind of in this to, how do I say this? Make a living? And yeah. so I don't want CVS to get rich off of my patients. I'd rather be able to succeed that way myself. All right. And then just one last question. Um, again, you kind of sort of covered this in the beginning part of your webinar, but when you're dealing with a, uh, a patient's parents, that's maybe a little skeptical uh, when you're presenting the importance of myopia management, do you have any key words or phrases that you use that really help overcome some of that skepticism and help um, increase that um, initial like uh, acceptance of the program? One of the key things that you can use is the Brian Holden Vision Institute's myopia calculator. Um, that's a really good tool to show the parent where their child may be later on. And then I think it's important to have a solid conversation with the child. What do they like to do? How's their school life? What are their hobbies? What are they having problems with? Because as I said, I think parents will invest in their kids before they invest in themselves. We actually did have one other question. Um, are you still okay for time if we, if we, sure. uh, yeah. Um, so we have a doctor that would like to know if you discuss axial length with your parents. Um, I do. Um, I do more now uh, because it's becoming standard of care. 
Uh, I'd like to say that I have the world's greatest biometer, but I don't. Um, I'm working on getting a new biometer that will be uh, easier to do on every patient, every visit. And then we can just make that much more of a routine. But parents do do research about this, especially if you ask them what research they've done at the consult. And um, sometimes they'll ask some really insightful questions. And whether you do axial length on every patient or you're just starting to, or you don't think you want to, be able to at least address it and any other questions they have. Excellent. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rob. Uh, for all of our attendees, thank you so much for um, spending time with us this evening. We really appreciate you. 